All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another market close. I am here. It is 3.45 p.m. Wednesday, April 10th. And more importantly, I am here on time today. Thank you, everybody, for being here. This has been a crazy day in the markets. Lots of stuff has happened since we left on the market open. And stuff that I don't think any of us really expected would happen based on the numbers we got this morning. But uh, they did happen. And they're pretty damn interesting to look at when you peel under the hood around what's going on in the stock market and how it's uh, starting to kind of open up towards the end of the day. So we're going to get through a lot of that stuff. Tesla holding up phenomenally. Elon Musk makes some big announcements in the context of Tesla Inda, India. We're going to talk about that. Um, Palantir not having the best day, but it was in the low 22s in the morning, recovered Nicely to 22.46 at one point, I think 22.50 down about 2% of the day. Nothing too crazy. 1.56% down. Robinhood got a nice bounce to 18.30. It fell to 17.53 today. Uh, back at 18.30. Coinbase up 2.68%. Bitcoin, we've got some new Bitcoin news on other countries that are potentially opening up the possibility for ETFs, particularly in Hong Kong. And that seems like it's actually coming sooner than we think it is. Bitcoin right now, 69,813. It is 200 bucks away from 70,000. It was at 67,400 this morning when the CPI numbers came out. MicroStrategy, as a result of that Bitcoin move, up 7.49% on the day. So a lot to talk about. We're going to get into it. And um, we're going to go through all the stuff going on in the market close. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. Shem Pasta, Open Skies, Joshua Thomas, Eric Wood, Ray, Dogecoin is there as well. We got to talk about Dogecoin. ET FaceTime, Clive, NVIDIA, obviously that's another big one. Ty Gordon, ER was right, sleeping through the market close. Nope, I am here. I haven't even took a nap. Uh, I am ready to go. June, Jarrett, uh, John, her tweet cap. Thank you all for being here today. Colorblind Co Collector, David, Digital Content, Endless Awareness, Midwest. Thank you all for being here. Now, one thing I will say, uh, well, actually two things before we get into what's going on in the markets. Uh, one thing that made me feel good about not sleeping or sleeping through CPI is that one of the other biggest financial accounts on Twitter also slept through CPI. It's funny too, because this guy, Gergovin, you guys probably know him. He's the guy who types in all caps. He has 377,000 followers. Literally, it's hilarious, dude. It's, it's kind of synonymous with what happened with me. So... So yesterday he said, um, yesterday he said, I don't know if I can find the tweet, but yesterday he said, uh, if you want to know the CPI tomorrow, you have to follow me, uh, like make sure you follow me or else you're going to like miss the CPI. Right. So he was like, make sure you follow my account. Cause I'll have the, I'll have the answers immediately. And, um, I don't know if I can find that tweet. I, I don't know if he still has the tweet, but the point is he was telling everyone, Hey, make sure you follow me. I'll be up early. If you want the CPI data, make sure you're following this account. You'll get all the answers. And then uh, he wakes up at 1247. At least I woke up at nine. He, this guy woke up at almost 1 PM and he says, good morning. Did I miss something? And I said, OMG, I slept through as well. So I guess the people who use caps, lock, caps locks end up sleeping through the big days. So it wasn't just me. It literally wasn't just me. For some reason, everyone slept through CPI today. Um, and maybe that resulted in CPI not being as bad as, as we thought it was going to be, even though it was still kind of bad. And then one other thing, I thought this was just hilarious. Uh, 40 minutes ago, I couldn't set up the stream because StreamYard was telling me, hey, the YouTube live is having an issue. Uh, they're not allowing us to set up streams or allow anyone to go live. And I was like, could you imagine somehow if this happened during the morning? And then instead of me having to do the walk of shame in the morning for oversleeping, I could have literally been like, sorry, guys, it was StreamYard's fault. I was really trying. I was like, you know, I was contacting them back and forth, but I just couldn't go live for CPI. It was StreamYard's fault. And I could have literally gotten away with everything. But unfortunately, that wasn't the case. And I had to take the walk of shame. Nonetheless, we're here. And uh, we are back for the market close. So let's start off with Tesla. Elon News. What did Elon say? Elon said two things. Uh, the first thing is that he is visiting Prime Minister Modi in India, or he's beginning to, well, I think this is the, the, the main announcement. This is the, the core thing that happened today. Uh, looking forward to meeting with Prime Minister Narendra Modi in India. Uh, my argument is I believe he's creating more optimism and catalyst despite a very hot inflation report. Again, in the morning, we talked about the fact that Tesla right now currently at 172. Tesla should be in 165, 160-ish range. This was not a good CPI. And we're going to talk extensively about CPI in just a little bit. But this type of CPI means that um, it means that rates are likely going to be high for longer, if not higher for longer, probably not higher for longer, but high for longer. And that's not good for Tesla. Tesla needs rates, needs rate cuts in order to, 
um, you know, get the market more excited about their fun, the fundamentals of their business. So higher rates are just making it harder for the market to buy up Tesla, down 35% year to date. However, if you're meeting with Modi in India, and there's been rumors about a gigafactory in India for a while now, I mean, that's definitely something to get the street excited. And we're seeing the street's optimism. It's down 2.7% on the day, but yesterday was at 179. You thought this CPI would make it I mean, I think all of us thought the CPI would really tank it if it if it if it if a CPI came in hot. CPI came in much hotter than what we thought. Tesla is doing okay at 171. India's bullish for Tesla. Apple today announced that one out of every seven iPhones is made in India. So we're looking at uh 14% of their iPhones are made in India, $14 billion worth of iPhones they announced over the past fiscal year 2023 were built in India. So we're seeing a lot of diversification in India. Someone asked, oh, why does it matter? Because Foxconn is still the manufacturer there. Uh, the wages are not that different. So their margins aren't necessarily increasing, yada, yada, yada. The reason this matters is because China invades Taiwan. If that happens, we would hope Apple has as much uh, of its supply chain diversified from the CCP as possible. So this is why this news was actually very important. And I think incredibly bullish for Apple. Tesla kind of kind of hampering on to this announcement today by saying that they seem to be expanding into India with Elon potentially going to meet Modi pretty soon. Uh, and we'll see how, how it plays out. But that was what Elon announced today. And I think that was very, very bullish in the context of, of Tesla. So that's what we got today for, for Tesla and some of the updates on that. Okay, let's talk about CPI. Let's talk about CPI. So I've been studying a lot about CPI ever since we had the report come out. For those that are just joining, headline CPI was uh, 3.5 and um, core was 3.8. So two things on CPI that I want to, to discuss. Uh, the first thing is why is the market rebounding? So the obvious thing I think and I, that's on everyone's mind today, right, is that the market rebounded. I mean, most of the stocks you own, unless you're in like the crappiest company companies, they've they've rebounded pretty nicely today. Apple was down to 167. Amazon was at 182. Snowflake was at 151. S and P was at 512. It's at 514. Still down one percent of the day, but I mean, like again, this was a hot CPI. The market bought the dip. Nvidia, for goodness sakes, is up two percent on one of the hottest CPI reports of of 2024. So my perspective on this is is as follows. I think there's two reasons the market is eagerly deciding to buy this dip. Uh, SoFi did take a hit. Uh, SoFi did bounce in the beginning of the day, then it took a hit. Right now it's down about uh, 4, 4.5%. 4 I tried to put it in an order for some more options, but they have not filled. Uh, so SoFi, yeah, SoFi definitely took a hit, but the majority of stocks have bounced pretty nicely. I think there's two main catalysts for this. Number one is AI. I don't have to go super deep into this, but everyone knows that AI is real. It's coming. We know it's coming. We've seen it in the numbers. Q2 is starting or Q1 earnings are starting in two weeks. So when those numbers really start to rack up for the metas, Amazons, SMCIs, Microns, and videos of the world, I think the market's going to look at themselves and be like, do we really think inflation is that big of a deal for us not to have exposure to some of these companies in a world in which these are the companies to bet on? Like there's only, uh, uh, I would say, you know, out of the 4,000 companies that are pro public, probably 50 to 75 that are really good companies to go long on. And a lot of those companies operate in the AI space. So I think the market is factoring that in. On top of that, AI is deflationary, right? We know AI is deflationary. We know that AI uh, is going to create massive levels of deflation across entire workflows. I'm experiencing it every day using ChatGPT. So if that's the case, betting on some of these AI stocks is kind of a hedge against inflation because if these companies are able to put up the numbers, that will eventually lead to more deflation, even if not in the next six to 12 months and uh, potentially be a reason for why these companies are cheap. Number two, the reason I think the market's rebounding is that we know inflation is going to come down. The increase in CPI, primarily shelter and energy, 50% of it or over 50% is those two categories. Energy is going through a Middle East crisis, which maybe it takes a few more weeks or months for it to head down, but we're not going to have longer, uh, higher oil prices, I believe, for the rest of the year. I personally don't think that's going to happen. I think it'll ease up uh, probably over the next two months. But shelter will eventually trend down as well. New home sales were up in February. Inventory was up as well. So I think the market has to ask itself a question. Is inflation that bad where we think we are getting no rate cuts and is AI not going to be a catalyst to propel earnings? And I think the answer to both of those questions is no. And that's what the market has said so far, that AI is not that bad and earnings will be propelled through AI. Therefore, we should reasonably look at uh, at looking at you know buying some of these stocks as they dip today. Uh, Tesla right now at 171. On top of that, what was also very interesting, and we'll get to the Fed's minute summary in a second, Joe Biden was talking with the Prime Minister of Japan today. And uh, as Surfer Boy says in the chat, plus CPI is backwards looking, that is also correct. A lot of lagging data 
that is there. Um, Joe Biden said the Fed will give us rate cuts and they may be delayed by a month. He just flat out said this, dude. He just said like, yes, we're getting rate cuts and they might be delayed because the CPI was hotter than expected, but we will get them. I don't know if a president's supposed to be saying that. I'm sure, you know, the presidents are not supposed to be being overly bullish or bearish on the possibility of rate cuts because the Fed is supposed to be an apolitical institution. But again, when Jerome Powell, when he was testifying in Congress said, yeah, the Fed is apolitical. Um, those comments are hard to believe when J J Joe Biden himself says, no, no, you're going to get a rate cut. Don't worry. Now, either Joe Biden's talking out of his ass and he's actually not colluding with the Fed and he's just saying it to say it. And the Fed just is like, oh, he's just the old guy saying stuff and we don't actually take him seriously. Or they legit, dude, you know, talk and uh, Joe Biden let the cat out of the bag that says, yeah, we're going to get a rate cut. If I even like, look, the worst thing is if Joe Biden was colluding with the Fed or forget Joe Biden, any president colluding with the Fed, why would you say it so publicly? Why would you like, just like, just like, don't say anything. Like, you know, it's going to happen if you, if you, if you got it in the bag, but when you say it, it, it decreases government legitimacy, which is a bad thing, you know, when it comes ultimately to trusting the government or the Fed as being apolitical. And this is another reason why people like Bitcoin. I mean, at the end of the day, this is what I become more sympathetic to the bull case for Bitcoin. When you see how much of a game the monetary system and fiscal policy is, you start to realize something that's truly decentralized might be the answer because at, at this point, you, every presidential administration, whether it's Trump, Biden, are probably going to be colluding with the Fed to some extent because they want to advance their political agendas, their 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 um, their agendas in which that uh, that help them get elected. Bitcoin doesn't care about elections or politics or any of that shit. Bitcoin is a whole different type of asset class, and it's not necessarily controlled by a federal reserve, by a centralized entity. Is it centralized to some extent because of Coinbase? Yeah, like I get it. There's, there, like, I understand that. It's not fully decentralized. But the ethos of that is what people are attracted to. And I think that's also why we're seeing Bitcoin up 1%. People, you know, when the CPI came in hot and Bitcoin dropped, it's because Bitcoin tends to work and, um, and, 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 and trend with growth stocks like the NASDAQ versus as a hedge to inflation. I don't think that argument is the best. But when you see, you know, Biden basically acting the way he's Biden, acting so nonchalantly around the nature of inflation, People tend to see more legitimacy in an asset that's a bit more decentralized. So that's what we had in the context of Joe Biden and what he also said today. Okay, now what were the Fed minutes? We got three minutes till the market closes. Let me read off these Fed minutes real quick. It's just a quick summary on them. Um, they basically said the same thing we all expected. However, they were a little hawkish in the context of how they think of inflation. Uh, so they said three things. Number one, they need more data to show inflation is going to 2%. Uh, I think we all knew like data-driven stuff, right? The same stuff we always... Uh, they've, they've talked about. And then they, um, they said that, uh, higher inflation still seems to be an issue. So they're saying like, Hey, the CPI today basically showed us that yes, inflation is bad. And then third geopolitical events, keeping inflation alive with rising energy prices. So they basically said, yes, inflation's high. We need more data to get to 2%. And the geopolitics right now, the turmoil, they called it is leading to, um, push inflation higher with rising energy prices. So they didn't say anything that crazy on the downside. They cited a more balanced labor market, enhanced technology, along with economic weakness in China and a deteriorating commercial real estate market. Ironically, we talked about this in the morning with Chris, uh, lowering rates can probably help a lot of these issues because one of the reasons the housing market is, is, is being inflated right now is because no one wants to sell a house and then buy a house with a 7% mortgage. So if you lowered rates, there would actually open up more inventory because people would be willing to sell. Buyers would be willing to buy, which theoretically could actually decrease um, or, or, or yeah, increase supply and decrease demand, which would actually lead to some deflation in the labor market, but the feds or in the, in the real estate market, but the feds probably not going to do that. So the feds in a bit of a pickle right now, they know this inflation report was not good. You've got the bears coming out on Twitter today saying that I told you so there's no rate cuts happening. We know that inflation's a problem. It's not 3.5%. It's way more than that. And we're not going to get a rate cut this year. And the stock market is artificially inflated. I think there's an argument you can make there. The other argument that a lot of those bears tend to not look at, which is like the more fundamental analysis of just like actually studying companies. And when you listen to 10,000 earnings calls, you start to really understand, actually, at the end of the day, you're buying a business. And if you're buying a pound here, an Adobe, a Microsoft, and NVIDIA, there is a business associated with that outside of the macroeconomic landscape, i.e. AI, which matters. And then you look at the macroeconomic landscape, and I'm just not as bearish as some of those people are in regards to inflation not being solved. I think there's a lot of data saying it's coming down, but that, latest, that data is lagging. And until we get that data, you know, we're not going to see that in the numbers. Bitcoin, 70,000 right now. There you go. So you got Bitcoin trending higher. Not bad to see on a day with some pretty tough inflation. April 10th, Wednesday, 4 p.m. market close. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Stock market is now closed.
All right. What do we got? What do we got? What do we got? What do we got? The market is now closed. Russell down 2.8%. That is correct. The Russell took a hit on. We all know why the Russell takes a hit. If inflation's sticky, rates are not going to come down for a while, which means these unprofitable companies in the Russell uh, aren't really going to get the premium that they want from the market. So that one is down. Let's see what else we have. So let's start off with Mag7. Let's start off with Mag7 and see how they took a hit today. Apple down 1%. Microsoft down about 1%. Meta up 0.5. Google down 0.3. Amazon up uh, basically flat. NVIDIA up 2%. NVIDIA just the star of that. NVIDIA is higher than it was yesterday, guys. Yesterday, NVIDIA was 830. Today, NVIDIA, or it ended at like 840 or something. Today's NVIDIA is 870. I mean, it's just absolutely incredible that investors, you know what NVIDIA signals? NVIDIA signals investors were looking for any reason why they could get NVIDIA cheaper prices. And I think that is something to take seriously. If NVIDIA gets eaten up today, that dip gets just like, you know, it just gets eaten up 2%. It goes to 820, 830 people buy it. It means that investors liked that CPI came in hot because it got them cheaper NVIDIA. They don't care why it's cheap. They just wanted it cheaper and they bought the dip. So really promising price action there on NVIDIA. And then Tesla 171 down 3% of the day. Not that big of a deal um, given all the controversy Tesla's been through over the past few weeks. Let's go to the crypto companies. What do we got? All right, so Bitcoin at 70,000. CleanSpark up, uh, down 1.83% of the day. The miners are not performing with Bitcoin. Bitcoin propelled towards, towards the end of the day. Miners did not necessarily follow on that level. So that was not the best for some of the miners. Marathon as well down about 0.2%. Coinbase, nice day, up 3.31%. Robinhood, 1834, up 0.22%. Again, Robinhood dipped to 1759. We'll talk about why high rates are actually good for Robinhood. I did a tweet about that. Um, I think that's the dirty little secret about Robinhood. High interest rates are actually very good for their business, which is why it's one of the most unique stocks in 2024 because it has a lot of things going for it, including high rates, which most companies don't have from that perspective. Uh, Bitcoin 69 just fell, 69.972. And then MicroStrategy, amazing recovery up 8% of the day, bottomed at 13.75. The dip got eaten up as well because people think that Bitcoin's going to the moon. MicroStrategy, a nice leverage play on Bitcoin. Again, I think the firm that's out there shorting MicroStrategy, I forgot the name of the firm, I just think their thesis is so wrong. They might be right on the technical in terms of the premium MicroStrategy is getting in, in regards to Bitcoin, but I don't think they're analyzing market sentiment and FOMO when it comes to people just wanting it as a proxy play. And even if there's a premium, that premium will still be rewarded by the market. Now, a couple of stories here. Uh, real quick in the context of Bitcoin, one thing I wanted to say is that Hong Kong is getting very close to approving Bitcoin ETFs. That news broke this morning by Reuters. Yeah, so here we go. Let, we'll go back to some of these equities, but real quick, let me just show you this while we're on the topic of Bitcoin. Hong Kong set to approve its first spot Bitcoin ETF in April. We'll see if that happens. Uh, but if that does indeed happen, two people familiar with the matter said to Reuters, the timeline would make Hong Kong Asia's first city to offer the popular ETFs and much faster than industry expectations. That just means more money is coming into this thing. It means instead of the I think 15 billion, the United States, 11 ETFs have been able to pour into Bitcoin. Now you got the Asian markets coming in, specifically Hong Kong. When Hong Kong does it, does Singapore go out next? Does Malaysia go next? You know, does India get excited for this thing? Like wh where, where does this chain reaction go and how quick does it happen? Also, one thing to remember, if the halving event creates a supply shock and that supply shock leads to 80, 90,000 Bitcoin, do not underestimate FOMO. All these countries will have FOMO. <laughs> like, like El Salvador is going to be just counting their dollars from their $30,000 average on Bitcoin. And a lot of these countries are going to be like, why do we not have some Bitcoin? Especially as it's going up and up and up. All countries to me are going to deal with FOMO, forget just individuals. And so we might see ETF approvals across the world happen a bit quicker. Is it super likely? I don't know, because again, ETFs are very hard to get approved. But if Hong Kong sets off the chain reaction, given the United States was able to do it and we get a nice little pump on Bitcoin based on the halving event, we could see something like that happen. And I think that's what the market is betting on, at least right now as well. SoFi took a nasty hit down 4%, wasn't able to recover too much. Again, this one is short 20%, so it's going to have a bad day on days like this. But for the far majority of the day, it was at 780, 785, which was not too bad. Ethereum right now, 3,500. PayPal, great price action on PayPal as well, as well down 1.67%. If this was two months ago, PayPal would be at like $43 or something. It, just, it was just, it was, it was getting hit by every last bit of news today. It kind of just took it on the chin. I think that's the analogy. Most of these companies took it on the chin. They all took, um, they all took this inflation report on the chin and it wasn't as bad as people thought it was going to be. Um, but, 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 why would China allow this if Bitcoin is banned in China? Well, so China wouldn't allow it. 
right? Now, in the context of Hong Kong and China, obviously, that's very geopolitically dicey, but Hong Kong's going ahead, and maybe the CCP tries to step in and stop them, but um, so far, Hong Kong seems to say they're going to do whatever they want, and we'll see if that brings up tensions with China. Right now, China needs to worry about its own its own country. I mean, you got Apple that's trying to leave China to go to India. It's, it, it, you know, Tesla trying to diversify in India. It, China needs to worry about making sure their economy is is at least set because right now they're going through a lot of turmoil. So if they try to pick a fight with Hong Kong, I think that would just be stupid today. Uh, Arc, how did Arc do today? Was Arc was Arc hit? Arc forty seven forty one. So Arc was down two point three percent. Nothing too crazy. Tomorrow we get PPI. That's correct. We'll see if the producer price index. I mean, that's going to be higher if CPI was higher. But maybe the market baked in some of that bad news today. And we'll see how it goes. Intel down 3% of the day. Intel can't catch a break, dude. Intel cannot catch a break. I am starting to seriously look at Intel. I think the market's overselling it uh, stupidly. I, I, I don't think there's a reason it should be sold off this aggressively. However, their guidance for Q1 was not good. If you if, if we, if we you remember the Q4 earnings call, uh, I think they're going to do like $12 billion revenue. Last quarter, they did $15 billion. So like, yes, guidance is not great. The, the foundry revision business was not great in terms of the guidance they gave for profitability for 2027. But I don't know if it deserves to be down 14% in the past week. So Intel is one that I think we got to look at a little bit deeper uh, over the coming over the coming weeks. IWM down to two hundred bucks. That Destiny Tech ETF that was down twelve percent. They recovered a bit. It was down thirty percent at one point. Now it's down twelve percent. Uh, it was down thirty percent yesterday. So had a rough couple of days, but that one recovered a little bit. Bitcoin right here just under seventy k. Disney down 0.68 percent. Clean Spark again down one point eight three percent. Oracle down one point two three percent, and then Spotify down about 024 percent of the day. S&P ends the day 514, down 0.97% as well. There we go. There we go. Gergevin just posted something interesting about Powell, okay? Oh, by the way, I got to show you guys a story that Bloomberg reported today about the CPI getting leaked yesterday. Um, if, they, if they're right about that story, then, dude, what a story. Okay, what? What is Gergevin post? Okay, so Gergevin, I love the guy, but sometimes he posts things that are inaccurate because he posts things very quickly. So I take this with a grain of salt, but the Fed chairman, Jerome Powell, was allegedly part of a sting operation by an investigative group. The hidden footage is expected to be released in an hour. Okay, I'll see it when I, I'll believe it when I see it, dude. This is, this is the, like, is like, I'm just going to Google this right now and see if, if what article he's looking at to see this information. Yeah, there's nothing on Google. I I don't know what his source is on this, where he got it from. So I would take this with a grain of salt. <laughs> um. This would not be good for the markets if Jerome Powell was part of some sting investigation. Um, it's Project Veritas. It might be. Project Veritas is good. They're very good undercover. For those that don't know those guys, these guys have hidden cameras and they'll 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 ask a lot of questions when people don't know they're being recorded, which is illegal, by the way. So I guess they somehow get away with it. But um, let's see. Let's see what this happens. Again, uh, Gergevin tends to, like last time Robinhood was down for five minutes after their gold event, they were down for five minutes from four to 405. They were down a little bit and he and he tweeted, Robinhood's down, blah, blah, blah. And everyone's like, oh my God, Robinhood's stealing your money again. And I'm like, dude, you just needed to wait five minutes before the app was back up. Like there was a lot of traffic. They just announced a bunch of features. They were getting a ton of downloads. So I tend to take him with a grain of salt, but we'll see. We'll see what he says. Now, another piece of news that I did see today that I thought was incredibly interesting uh, and this one seems to be from the New York Times and Bloomberg, so a little bit more trustworthy here, is that BlackRock and JP Morgan were given insider information from the Bureau of Labor Statistics around CPI, and they were on a special email list called Super Users along with hedge funds. This info gave traders a massive edge on their bets. We saw the market move at around 3.30 yesterday to the upside based on what people thought was potentially a CPI leak. Now, the weird thing is if the CPI did leak and it was bad, I don't know why the market moved to the upside yesterday uh, at 3.30. Like it should have moved to the downside, but it, it did like a kind of V-shaped recovery. So it was very weird how the market acted. But um, that is something that potentially did happen. And this is why it's hard to beat Wall Street because Wall Street a lot of times just has access to more information than other people. This is why either you go long and you beat Wall Street or you really study a company when it's in the dirt, like Pounder at six, Robin at seven, maybe SoFi at eight, and you get in there before Wall Street discovers it. But if you're trying to do the day-to-day -day, day trading thing, it's hard, dude, because Wall Street knows a lot of more information before everybody else. And the crazy thing is the comments, and I'm seeing the comments in the chat, everyone believes that, right? Like we probably, yeah, they probably did give BlackRock and JP Morgan the data before everybody else because like, just Google JP Morgan, $920 million fine, 2020. They got fined almost a billion dollars 
for illegal market making activities. I remember I saw this shit in 2020 and that's when I was like, damn, this shit's actually rigged. And, um, and they paid it off. Like it was nothing, dude, it was a little parking ticket for them and they moved on. So definitely believe that was possible, but it was weird that it moved to the upside if CPI was bad last night as well. Um, it's not even wall street. It's super intelligent AI algorithm trading. That is also true, dude. I mean, I, I, I want to interview a quant trader one day and try to see how in depth do the variables that are plugged into the algorithms go? Because when the fed presidents speak, I think the algorithms use NLP nat uh, natural language processing and interpret the words the fed is saying, and then maybe use some type of GPT or Gemini behind it to try to make sense of those words. And then they make market decisions based on those words. Um, we see that when Kashkari talked a couple of days ago, boom, the market tanked when he said we won't get rate cuts. So I think the algorithms can interpret bad or good news and then move on top of that. And, um, you know, maybe that's happening. Maybe that happened yesterday if they, if they got the CPI a little early. So that's what we're seeing right now in the context of what's going on with the markets. Let's get an update on rate cuts and what we'll see in the context of CPI. Morgan Stanley here says that we might have to wait a little bit before we get those. So let's get an update. Let's get an update on that. All right, here we go. So sticking with the June cut for now, even after today's CPI report, joining me now are Matt Hornbach, Global Head of Macro Strategy at Morgan Stanley, Kevin Mon, Chief Investment Officer at Henyon and Walsh. Um, gentlemen, thanks for being with me on set. Matt, I got to go to you first, because you, are you still expecting a June rate cut? Well, I think our, our economists would tell you that this data point definitely causes risks to shift towards a cut later in the year, I think is how they, they're framing it. And so while they're still sticking with that June rate cut, mm -hmm. they do acknowledge that the risks clearly are pointing to a rate cut that is late, starts later in the year. Okay. Kevin, I wonder if you can react to yes. what we're seeing in bond yields, particularly that 10-year that seems to have had an impact on equities. Yeah, I would start by suggesting that the path forward for three rate cuts this year, which the Fed confirmed just a couple of weeks ago with their March star plot chart still exists, with one potential rate cut at the end of July. They don't meet in August. They're not going to hike again in September because that might look too political with their last meeting before the election. They come back in November, cut one more time, 25 basis points, and perhaps one final cut of 25 basis points in December, getting us to those 75 basis points in cuts this year. I don't know if that's going to happen, but the path forward still exists. But regardless, I don't know when they're going to cut first, but rates are going to be lower over the next three years. And if rates, yields, and inflation are lower, that creates opportunities in both stocks and bonds, D. Right. Um, but, you know, the Fed is data dependent, right? Even if they factored that in, that could be changing with the latest numbers that we've had. How much weight do you put into these CPI numbers? The preferred metric is TCE, which we get at the end of the month. Do you think that, and we talked about this with Steve, right? third month in a row kind of makes a trend. Do you think that Fed officials are gonna be willing to call this seasonal and think that maybe they can, the economy can handle a cut? Well, I think when you look at the underlying data that we got today and its implications for PCE later in the month, I do think that it will cause the Fed to kind of say, look, I mean, this could be a trend. We don't know, there's a lot of uncertainty in the economy. When we look at the underlying data that the Fed likes to look at, this is the core services metric, X housing. This has been accelerating on a six month mm -hmm. average basis. So I, I would suggest that they're going to say, oh, maybe we need to see another three, four prints before right. we be, really get comfortable with the underlying trends here. There's inflation, but the other side of this is the jobs data yes. and the economy kind of proof that higher rates aren't actually as restrictive as many had thought. So do you think that there's a need to front run and perhaps cut to make sure that we get a soft landing? It's a really difficult question to answer because the Fed is really trying to thread the needle here. I think back to the 1970s, which was the last time the Federal Reserve cut interest rates prior to inflation getting back down to their 2% target. What happened? Inflation return hit double digit levels. Paul Volcker stepped in, raised the Fed funds mm -hmm. target rate to 20%. 20%, we think five and a quarter percent is restrictive. Can you imagine 20%? <laughs> yeah. That killed inflation, but it also brought on a recession. That's what the Fed right. is trying to grapple with right now. That's good perspective. But I want to ask you about the equity reaction, sure. right? Since we saw that 10-year auction, um, markets are at session lows, and they've been pretty resilient so far to rising bond yields. Has the character of the market changed? I don't think so, but I do believe the market's got a bit ahead of themselves this year, pricing in the perfect execution of a soft landing by the Federal Reserve, which I don't think we're at that point just yet. 
but there are other areas of the equity markets that are going to continue to move higher regardless of when the Fed cuts interest rates for the first time, such as artificial intelligence. An advisor asked me the other day, what inning are we in the AI boom? And I suggest that we're only in batting practice of a yeah. doubleheader. There's so much more opportunities that lie ahead in data centers and software and hardware. And of course, in semiconductors and chips. Well, I usually sit in San Francisco. Wow, that 10-year dude, 4.56, 4.56 on the 10-year. Where is the 10-year at right now? Let's take a look. That's also not been the best for the market, 4.54. So basically the same level. However, again, it was a bad CPI report, right? We all acknowledge. It was a bad CPI report. Market's not as hit as we thought it was. Maybe the selling is going to take a few days for it to hit in, but you would think on a day like today, the market would take a pretty big tumble. s and is down 1%. It's not, it's, it's not, and, 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 and to give context, the s and is up like 9% year to date, you know, so it's just, it's really interesting to see the market eat it up. We have not had a day yet to my understanding in the stock market this year where there was bad news on a macro perspective or like a geopolitical perspective and the market sustained a pretty resilient sell-off and maybe that day is coming and we don't know when it's coming. Maybe it's another bad CPI because then it's going to be four in a row and then the market really is like, you know what, inflation, you know, uh, what, what, Powell's going to have to go Volcker because this thing's not dying out. But right now the market doesn't believe that. Right now the market believes that this is the time to buy the dip because these are good opportunities to get companies that are executing really well in the context of earnings. Canada said they might cut in June this morning. Yup, that news was big today. And uh, Canada's market, their, I don't know the name of their their version of the S&P 500, but their market hit an all-time high yesterday. So uh, to them, they also feel that they're considering a rate cut, even though their uh, their market has hit an all-time high, uh, all high today. Uh, the, right now, they've had their interest rates uh, steady at 5%. They didn't make any, Bank of Canada didn't change their interest rates today. But in June, that might happen. Fitch, uh, Fitch, that 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 um that credit rating agency, uh, downgraded China today. So they downgraded the United States uh, a couple months ago, which also was not good for the regional banks. Uh, Fitch revised its China sovereign debt credit outlook from stable to negative, while affirming its A plus rating on April 9th amidst mounting concerns regarding the nation's public finance outlook, particularly as it navigates uncertain economic terrain during a transition away from property relying growth towards what the government deems a more sustainable model. Basically saying there's a lot of real estate in China that is just not worth anything. The economy needs to grow. And until they grow, it's not really the best to buy up China sovereign debt. Now, having said that, my question becomes, what are going to be the companies that actually propel China's economy to go forward? I think a lot of the times we forget that a country is just made up of people, government, and ultimately companies that allow the tax revenue for those governments to operate and the jobs for those people to have so that they don't go insane. So companies really do matter. And China has just been anti-tech and anti-big tech and anti-government, uh, anti-innovation uh, for a couple of years now. Beijing has said that they're starting to change their tone on this. I don't know if that tone is necessarily going to change. But it also gives me hope that they're not going to mess with things geopolitically as badly. Alibaba was up about 2% on the day. If they really do need to let the free market be the free market, they can't invade Taiwan if their economy is in shambles. Now, there is an argument for why they would be more compelled to invade Taiwan if that happens. But theoretically, they shouldn't do that. They shouldn't mess with Hong Kong trying to set up a Bitcoin ETF, even though they'll mess with Hong Kong for a bunch of other reasons, if their economy is in shambles. They need to focus on figuring out how do they make 10 more Alibabas and give the incentives to people to make the next open AI in China and make that shit commercially profitable. And I think if they're focused on that, maybe that is a, a bright side for uh, for the market, at least even, even if there's a lot of other geopolitical tensions that's going on right now. Thomas says, if China's population is supposed to get a cut and is supposed to get cut in half, isn't their real estate market going to be effed? Yeah. If their population does not continue to grow, and again, that one child policy, that was not a good thing for China for the years that they had it. Uh, it's leading to some of the problems we're seeing right now. Um, yeah, the real estate market, like no, who's going to live in the real estate, right? Like it, real estate's not gold. There has to be some value to it. Yes, it goes up over time, but it goes up over time because there's this perception that people will be able to live in that real estate. And then if you have California real estate on the beach, that's very valuable from a perception perspective because people would pay a premium to live there. there that's why it goes higher. Gold, the idea is people will wear it. People find some value in it. Therefore, it is, it's going to go up over time. Um, in the context of real estate that's not being used, you know, if it's in the middle of nowhere and it's just a big building, I mean, if you, the, the, the 60 Minutes documentary on China is fantastic. They, 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 they took a tour of like thousands of buildings in mainland Beijing that are just not being used. 
from a real estate perspective. That's not good. Those assets are not going to go up. They're not going to appreciate it. Half of the Chinese middle class's wealth is in not the stock market of China, not gold, not Bitcoin. It's in real estate. And they've really got to figure out how do they navigate that situation um, in order to get in order to get some more momentum for their economy. We got Hugo bought some more Nike at 89. Interesting. What's your logic on buying Nike at 89, Hugo? I'm curious. What was the what was the thought process on on buying Nike there? Um but, but, but. Ashman says China's anti-tech Germany. <laughs> Hold my beer. <laughs> well, Germany seems like they're probably gonna get some pound to your software given uh given what's been going on with the terrorism threats there. So we'll see if they uh if they pivot a little bit. Let me know in the chat if you bought anything. I didn't buy any of the dip today, guys. Uh I, I couldn't even wake my ass up on time. So I did like someone during the live stream in the market room, they're like, Amit, are you buying the dip? I'm like, dude, I'm trying to not pee on myself right now. Like I'm not, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like a mess in the morning. I'm just trying to get through the stream right now. So I didn't do any buying at all. I tried to buy some SoFi, some options, but they didn't fill. Um, so, so we'll see. And overall, let me also know what what was your portfolio hit today? Like, what, was it a bad day for the portfolio? Like, my portfolio went down a bit, but not aggressively because again, things rebounded towards the end of the day. And so I didn't do any buying. Let me know any buying you did, and then what does your portfolio look like after the market has closed? Uh, I bought Hood. Okay, cool. Bought some Robinhood, not bad. Bought some Tesla, not bad either. Uh, 171 probably if you went to that level. I wonder if Kathy bought anything interesting today. She didn't. She did some buying yesterday of like Teladoc and she bought a little bit of Pound here, but nothing too crazy. Um, Amit, have you not taken your pee since this morning? No, I I, I took my pee. It's okay. <laughs> I, I went to the bathroom after a three hour stream and I did, I, I, I finished that. But, but the point is like, it was just a very, um, stressful morning with everything going on. And then you would think that dip would last longer for me to buy the dip, but the dip, like, dude, but within the first 10 minutes of the stream, the dip was kind of gone, at least on Robin and Bounter, the dip, like the dip was 22 and 17, five, both stayed at 22, five and 18 for the rest of the day. So that dip was pretty much gone. June is down 17,000, bought some hood and ZTS. Okay. Not bad. Bought 50 K of hood and market open. Whoa. So what price Landon did you get on that 50,000 of hood? Micro at 1390, not bad, dude. I was looking at some technicals and micro at 1375 seemed to be from multiple accounts I looked at um, the bottom. And so 1390 is very close to the bottom, at least for now, right? If Bitcoin goes to 60,000, that thing is going to tank. But uh, if Bitcoin holds these levels, that seems like it's a great, a great, a great price. Um, one thing about Robin, so I said I would mention this. Let me pull this up as well. Oh, it was very funny. Vlad had to respond to someone today. Um, Someone said, uh, this is super funny. So if you go to his replies, someone said, uh, I don't know who needs to hear this, but don't put your money in Robinhood. And Vlad is like, <laughs> please let me know how we can make the service better for you. <laughs> so he was just like, all right, buddy, it's, uh, that's fine. But like, please tell us what's going on. Let, let me, let me see how I can help. So here's what I wrote up today on Robinhood that I thought was really interesting. Uh, the dirty secret and why I'm bullish this year is I think this is one of the companies that's in a situation where it has almost everything going for them. They did $236 million of net interest revenues last quarter. For, for To simplify what that means, that means if interest rates are high, they took all their cash and they found a way to make $236 million, a quarter of a billion dollars in 90 days off of those interest rates being high. So I think when interest rates go down, it actually hurts their business in its current state. Now, the reason they say it won't hurt their business is because stocks should go higher as rates come down. Theoretically, that's a correct, right? The inverse relationship between rates going lower and stocks going higher is true. However, stocks have gone higher as rates have gone higher. So if trading volumes, which is transaction revenues, don't dramatically increase for Robinhood, then rate cuts are not going to yield them more transaction revenues. Those more transaction revenues are not going to yield them more revenue. The, the higher rates are actually going to lead them to more revenue, ironically. So to me, they have $5 billion in cash. They just announced massive products that lead them to have fundamentals to the upside with the gold events, massive crypto play. And then high rates allow them to lure customers in. They get those customers. Eventually, rates will get cut. They can't give a 5% APY, but at least they got you in the door. And now you're part of their ecosystem and you can use them for the future just because they got you in with that gold subscription for the 5% APY, 3% credit card, et cetera. So it bounced off 1750 today. And I think it's because the market was ready to buy shares below 18 because they kind of knew what is happening. And they knew that rates are actually very good for Robinhood, which is, it's so crazy, right? It's a crypto play. It's inverse to rates going down. And they just announced some crazy fundamentals that are actually propelling the company forward in terms of like real growth with all the gold product announcements. So I thought that was super interesting in the context of what we saw 
uh, for Robin. Hood. Lena says, I, I, I think I, I think you meant to say nibbled, not nippled, but uh, nibbled on, on Apple shares today. But I will buy more at 160 ish. Okay, not bad. Costco increased their dividend to 116. Wow, not bad for Costco. That's big. Where's Costco after hours right now? Costco increased their dividend. Costco, wow, look at that. Costco was up today and it's up after hours, about 0.24%. See, this is another thing. This is a great piece of news. Thank you for that, Leslie. If Costco's increasing their dividend, Costco is saying to the market, hey, stock market investors, we have too much money. We don't know what to do with our money. So we're going to give it back to shareholders. We don't know where to invest it. We don't know where to put it into treasuries or uh, R&D or yada, yada, yada. All we know what to do is to give it back to you guys. So here you go. Thanks for being a shareholder. This to me is not something you see in a recession. You do not see companies increasing their dividend by eight cents a share. That's a lot of money times the however many outstanding shares they have. I think it's like five, six billion shares that they're going to have to pay out. They're doing that because they have the money and they looked at the economic projections and the data for going into the future and they have the ability to afford that. Their market cap's 320 billion. How much is their float? Oh, 443 million shares outstanding. So 443 million times a dollar sixteen every quarter they're going to be paying in dividends if you if you own those shares or sorry fourteen cents yeah fourteen cents so pretty incredible dude pretty 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 incredible and again it's another bullish thing to to see in the stock market you do not see companies do that and when in a, when a recession happens a company like Costco that their margins aren't that good they're primarily making money off the membership and then they have a couple of other kind of services part to their business but they they missed like 2 billion on revenue last quarter they were supposed to come in at 59 billion they came at 57 billion so their primary business is making sure that they can protect the consumer from uh, rising prices and make sure that consumers want to stay with them. When we have a recession, people stop shopping everywhere. You know, forget, forget Nike and Lululemon. Like people will pull back from Costco, even though that's a whole foods place or Costco will have to decrease prices and they'll have even worse margins. So for Costco to say, yeah, we're not going to keep this money hoarded with us. We're going to give it right back to you guys. That to me is incredibly bullish on where the market is going. And I think that's another reason why people bought the dip today because of things like what Costco is doing right now. Costco's up uh, 15, let me see, I think 15% year to date. So this is also a big winner if you have this in the port. Costco is up year to date, uh, 10%, sorry, 10%. Not bad, not bad at all for a big company like Costco. Um, Tariq says people are not pulling back from Costco, bro. Maybe, but I do think if we have a bad recession, people pull back from everywhere. Like th that's my understanding of how a recession operates. Like people will get a little bit more price conscious around everything. Or if they don't pull back from Costco, they're definitely not going to be as excessively buying, you know, instead of getting five uh, cartons of muffins there, they might get two, right? And they're gonna say, all right, I'm gonna eat less muffins, right? But they're just gonna be a little bit more price conscious when a recession happens, it happens to everybody. So and the market has to price that in. Um, but in this case, it seems like Costco thinks that their business is going to hold up and be strong. Apple right now, 167. Robinhood, 1835 after hours. That's up. Reddit down about 6% of the day. So a company like Reddit does not do well when we get bad CPI. DJT was down, wow, 9% of the day. I didn't even look at this the whole day. 9%. They are down. Uh, DJT is down and Reddit is down. Market cap of DJT currently 4.6 billion. Oh, by the way, Trump is suing two of his co-founders that started Truth Social. His argument is that they didn't set up the application pr pr properly. So if, if Trump gets their shares, he would own like 75% versus 60% of Truth Social, which would be bullish for him in terms of his equity position in the company. We'll see if that happens. But um, yeah, that is what Trump is attempting to do as well. Let's hear from Josh Brown, his thoughts on CPI and where the market's going to have to go based on the uh, based on the data we got today by the Fed. Here we go. Good setting rally now in serious jeopardy as rate cuts get pushed further and further out, with some now wondering if we'll get any at all. Let's ask Josh Brown. He's the co-founder and CEO of Ritholtz Wealth Management and a CNBC contributor. He's with me, as you can see, at Post 9. It's good to see you. Rick Reeder, BlackRock, tweeting earlier, this was definitely a setback. That's the word he used. Does it change your view on the market? Does it change the game for the bulls? I'm not one of these I told you so people, but I told you we were going to play this game, cut off, cut on. Today is a decidedly cut off day. It's exactly what you would expect to see 
if you think that we're set back from three down to two, from June down to July, that's exactly what's playing out on your screen. This is what I would tell you. You got small caps being hurt the worst. Again, textbook for a cutoff day. The IWM is down 3%. The S&P is down 1%. Uh, value underperforming growth. By the way, one of the only green stocks on my screen right now. NVIDIA, not a value stock. I don't know if you knew that. Um, but the value stocks are taking it on the chin. And then you think about why. It's very obvious we've had this huge rally in industrial companies, in financials. That's what tends to dominate the value indices. On the small cap side, consider 40% of debt held by Russell companies is floating rate versus just 21% to the S&P. So everything that's happening on your screen right now is exactly what you would have predicted if I would have given you this inflation print yesterday. Why is that relevant to tomorrow? Here's why. None of these rate panics have been a lasting hurdle for the S&P 500. We tend to process these things over 48 to 36 hours, and we will be back to the original game we were playing. And I think what you're seeing today is counter trend. The number one debate now, as silly as it sounds, is June versus July. The number two debate is two versus three in 2024. So let's say they go in July and they can't go in June. When's the next opportunity? They're not going to go in September. Too political. Can't do it in front of the election. So you get July, December. Those are your two cuts for 24. If that's a reason to not buy any of the stocks that you want to buy, I can't figure out that connection. So I think for the allocator that's watching this action, I think you're looking at an opportunity to get long, not to panic because you're getting slightly less relief on the interest rate okay, side. Okay, so you then don't think that today marks some kind of game changer for a rally that started at the end of October, has set new records, and even though we've had to rethink the direction of the Fed along the way, the greater trend is still up. It, look, it's a game changer if you're one of these people who piled into semis in the last two weeks, forgetting that they're cyclical. Um, it, it, it's certainly every single component of the SMH is down today except NVIDIA. So yes, if you chase the momentum trade because you thought rate hikes were going to continue to fuel it, maybe it's a game changer for you. I think most people have not been playing that game. I think for most people, they're in a good position. They're looking at the rest of their portfolio. Some of it's very rate sensitive. Some of it isn't. And they're just fine on a day like today. And I don't think materially anyone would really say like, oh, my whole investing outlook for the next year is now changed. Okay, so I just sorry, I exited out of StreamYard versus YouTube. So I was gonna say I agree. I actually agree with everything Josh Brown is saying right there, and I think it makes a lot of sense at the end of the day in the context of the the sort of overall argument he made for this idea of the debate between June or July. I mean, it would be pretty interesting if the debate was actually June or July uh, in two or three cuts versus if we're getting any cuts at all. Now, the bears would want you to think that the cuts are either, the debate is, are we going to get cuts? Or are we not going to get cuts? And I, a lot of bears on Twitter, I was reading out of my post, they're like, I told you we're not getting any rate cuts. I kind of agree more with Josh Brown, which is that this is a cut on cut off environment. And I think he wouldn't have as strong of a point as he just made right now if the economy can or if the market continued to tank throughout the day. But that V shape rebound, NVIDIA up two freaking percent today, goes to show you the market believes the rate cut is coming. It's a question of two or three, June or July, but they do believe it's coming. And if they do believe it's coming, then uh, it's going to be very, very exciting to see how the market interprets or how the stock, how stocks ultimately perform with the idea that rate cuts are on the way. Speaking of Costco, uh, they just released their March sales. They increased March sales 9.4% year over year. Another thing that goes to show you, it's very, I mean, their earnings are going to crush. Their earnings are going to crush. $23 billion in March ahead of 9% from last year at 21 0.46 billion. Now, overall, you know, gross margins, net income, we'll see EPS, we'll see how the earnings actually do. But right now, Costco is signaling to shareholders, hey, thanks for owning our stock. We have way too much money. We don't think uh, inflation is going to be an issue. In fact, Costco, Costco CEO 
on 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 the earnings call in July of 2023 said disinflation and deflation is very obvious in our raw goods supply chains, which means if they think deflation and disinflation is on the way and consumers have enough jobs to continue spending at Costco, they're more than happy to give people an extra 14 cents for owning their, these shares. And again, it's not about if you own Costco or if you don't own Costco, it's about the broader market. What does that signal? It signals a $320 billion company thinks that things are okay. And as a result of that, they're willing to put their money where their mouth is, which is giving money back to shareholders. I mean, it's really incredible to see that. I did not expect them to do that today. They're up around 0.30% uh, right now after hours, $724 of 10% for the year. Not bad at all. Not bad at all. June says I went to Costco the other day. They were packed. Yeah. I would I think my sister just got back from going to Costco the other day. Like Costco is Costco. It's gonna and the, and again, the thing is, if people didn't have jobs, they wouldn't be shopping as much. You know, like Costco wouldn't be putting up 10% year over year monthly sales growth. That's not the case. The data shows the obvious. It shows that shows uh, what is what is oblivious to people who think a recession should be obvious. It's like actually no, the data is pointing to the other direction. So I was I was really perplexed at a lot of people today on Twitter saying like we're never getting a rate cut. And I'm like you see the market's eating up this dip, right? Like the market pretty much believes we're going to get a rate cut. Um it's just a question of if inflation can really show us over the next few months that it's definitely trending towards the downside versus the upside. So there you go. There you go right now uh for for Costco. And I agree with Josh Brown. I think it makes a lot of sense right there. Costco selling gold and people buying it up. Does Costco still sell gold? they do that Costco gold bars. I thought they stopped doing that a while ago. Oh no, they do. They still do it. Wow. It's on their website. Yeah. You can buy it online. 24 karat gold. You can buy a full bar, one ounce bars on Costco. Interesting. I thought they stopped doing that a while ago. I guess they still do it. There you go. One. I, <laughs> maybe Costco's a gold <laughs> proxy play because gold, where's gold today? I don't even check gold price. Gold is up. Okay, let's look at gold. Let's look at gold. So gold right now, it's down 1% today. It's up 10% over the past 30 days and 25% over the past six months, dude. Holy crap. 30% in the past six months is gold. That's pretty damn incredible. Pretty damn incredible. And so, yeah, maybe that's another reason Costco's up because people are buying a bunch of gold. Um... Okay, cool. So that's what we got in the context of Costco. And we're seeing a little bit more momentum there. Let's get another update on rate cuts and what Goldman Sachs thinks about it. So we just heard from Josh Brown. Here is Goldman Sachs and what they think about when it comes to when we are getting that rate cut. First take on the data is the man behind that call, Jan Hatzius, chief economist and head of global investment research at Goldman Sachs. Good to see you. It's nice to see you. You're surprised today. I was. We thought it was going to be a low 0.3, and it ended up being 0.4. There's also some read-through into the core PCE numbers, which ultimately are going to matter more. We'll learn more about that tomorrow morning with the PPI numbers, but we've also lifted that to 29 basis points. And since it was already, I think, a little bit cuspy whether they would cut in June with this, it seems less likely. So, could still happen, but it's not my expectation. Okay. So you were at three cuts. Now you're at two cuts. What makes you so sure two is right, that that's the right number now? Well, we're never sure. As I said, I think it's possible that they cut in June and you could still get three cuts. I think that, that certainly could happen. But likewise, it's also possible that it moves back further. I mean, it's always very dependent on how the data come in. I think it tells you a lot more about the Fed than it tells you necessarily about the underlying adjustment in the economy. The disinflation, I still think a lot of the trends mm -hmm. are improving, and you can see that in the labor market as well. But for the timing of Fed cuts, these numbers do matter. What if the disinflation case is suddenly becoming harder to make? And it's going to be much stickier for much longer than any of us thought it would be. Are you entertaining that possibility? I think that's less likely because I, for that, I'd look not just at the CPI or PCE numbers, but I also look at, for example, 
the adjustment in the labor market, the fact that job openings have been trending down, the fact that quits have been coming down, the fact that wage growth continues to come down, all of that to me says we are disinflating, but it is taking longer. And I think the reason why it's taking longer is that some of these lagging categories in service inflation in particular, things like, you know, for example, auto insurance and health care costs, they, they've got a longer tail than we anticipated. So July seems to be now your base case. Is that is that fair to say? That's right. July is the first cut in our new forecast. So the PCE now becomes ever more important. What's your read through from today? What we might get tomorrow? By the way, before you even answer that question, does this make you now worried about what's going to happen tomorrow? Or do you is it a foregone conclusion at this point that PPI is not going to be great either? It's not a foregone conclusion. These things are not that closely related month on month. Uh, PPI will be another input into the PCE number. What they really care about is PCE. Sure. But most of the information for PCE comes into today's number, and then a smaller amount of information comes into tomorrow's number. Oh, well, that. So CME, Fed watch tool, and I agree with most of the stuff he's saying right there in the context of we got to look at the numbers and see how those numbers ultimately play out. Uh, May is targeting no cut or like a, yeah, basically no cut, like a three, I think that's, yeah, 3%. Ch- okay, so they're, they're targeting a 4% chance in May. June is targeting a 20% chance for a cut. July is targeting a 30, a 42% chance. September, market wants about 70% chance. November uh, goes to 80, and then December looking like around 89% chance. So May is kind of off the table right now. June looks like it's possible. I I would definitely say it's not June. Uh, If oil holds up, it's going to have to be July at the latest or at the earliest. And then after July, you know, if that doesn't hold up, then September, hopefully the cut comes. And if it comes in November, which is the month of the United States election, which is going to be one of the most, I guess, historic and significant elections ever, uh, that would be interesting. That would be very interesting. There's going to be a lot to cover during that time. And I'll make sure I don't sleep through those days because there's going to be a lot to to cover when it comes to that. Um, All right, there we go. Okay, so the Project Veritas, uh, Project Veritas video just dropped. It looks like, or no. Okay, remember that, remember Gergovin tweeted that thing about Jerome Powell and that Sting investigation? Let me show you guys the tweet. And then if you guys want to watch it, you can. But this is the tweet that just dropped. It looks like they illegally got him doing something. So I feel like this is going to be dumb, too. I feel like this is going to be dumb. Okay. Inside the Federal Reserve, hitting camera captures principal economist talking about Jerome Powell's legacy as someone who held the line against Trump. Oh, this is stupid, dude. This is so stupid. Under Powell, the Fed has changed to think about equity issues like racial. This is so dumb. This is someone's opinion at the end of the day. This is so dumb. So the undercover journalist is talking with someone who is close to Jerome Powell. And basically the dude is saying that Jerome Powell uh, doesn't like Trump or something. I mean, like, that's not what I thought would be in terms of a a, a spicy investor. I was thinking there's going to be a market moving uh, news around Jerome Powell and some controversy. This is some guy who's close to him basically saying he's not a fan of Trump. It's like, okay fine like that's you can say you get fine that's like that's, that doesn't really affect anything the market doesn't give a shit about that yeah this is dumb this is, i'll put it in the chat if you want to watch this you can watch this i don't think it's gonna have any impact on the market um i think it's gonna have zero impact in the market and powell was put in under trump that's correct Powell was put in, like literally he was put in under trump and look at the end of the day these fed presidents and and, and people that work in government they have political opinions they can't state them publicly but they still have a vote the Supreme Court justices still get to vote, even though they can't say if they're Republican or, cons- or or Democrat, right? So the idea that there's a leaked video of someone saying, "Oh, Powell is a little bit more Democratic than conservative," it's like that's not that's not a market moving event, in my opinion. So yeah, and again, see, this is why when Gergovin tweets something like, "Oh my God, breaking news," it devalues his brand a little bit because I'm like, dude, like you have three hundred thousand followers. People, when you say something, people are going to trust it. When you tweet something that's really not that big of a deal. You know, people tend to not trust you as much when you put something out. So if you guys want to watch it, you can watch it here, but I don't think it's going to be a super, super market moving event at all. Okay, cool.
that is it for me. Um, thank you everybody for being here. I'll be live tomorrow on the market open. 8.45 a.m. I'll actually be here. So <laughs> Penn said he doesn't like Trump as well. Yeah, dude, all these guys have political opinions. And look, at the end of the day, I don't think Jerome Powell did. People say, okay, let's say, so let's say the logical syllogism is Jay Powell doesn't like Trump. Therefore, in 2018, he raised interest rates to spite Trump. That's the dumbest thing. I, I, like he raised interest rates during that time because we needed to raise interest rates. And then he cut pretty swiftly with Biden. You, like what does he, Biden doesn't want to have high interest rates. He raised high the interest rates, the highest they've been in 40 years. Even if he's like Joe Biden's biggest fan, he did something that really Joe Biden did not like, which was raise interest rates dramatically. I mean, no president wants to see interest rates that high because then people can't finance a car or a house, all that stuff. Uh, so, so the idea that him not liking Trump was the reason he raised rates in 2018, then how do you explain him raising rates in 2022 with Biden? You know, it doesn't make a lot of, a lot of sense to me from that perspective. But all right, there you go. We'll see. Yeah, maybe if Trump gets into office, he'll fire Powell. Maybe. I mean, you never know. You never know. We'll we'll see. We'll see what happens. But that election cycle is definitely gonna be interesting. And we'll be covering it every single day on the channel. I'll be here live, making sure I don't oversleep. <laughs> and I'll make sure I'll get some good sleep tonight, dude. I'm not sleeping at 4 a.m. today. I'm going to the gym right after this. Going back, going to run third day in a row. And then I'll probably go to sleep at like 10 p.m. early today and be ready tomorrow. All right. That's it for me. Thank you everybody for being here. Uh, where am I getting these shirts? So my boy, Ryan, he sent me these shirts. You guys remember he was on the Palantir stream when Palantir had 27 bucks. Um, he said the other day he ran out of, uh, inventory. So I don't even think there's any inventory left, but I'm sure when he reloads the store, he'll, he'll join one of these streams and he'll put the link in there. Um, yeah, he makes these custom shirts in like Pennsylvania and he sent me a bunch of these. So I, I, it's, it's from him and I'm, I'm sure once he reloads inventory, he'll send the link and you guys can buy up some of these shirts if you want. Okay, that's it. Thank you, everybody. I'll see you guys tomorrow, 8.45 a.m. And we'll keep going. Bad CPI, market ate up the dip. Market ate up the dip. And now we just got to see on that PPI data tomorrow if the market continues to eat up this dip. All right, have a good one. Bye, everyone. See you tomorrow. Good night.